Thank you, Christopher. That was a lot more than I was expecting. Thank you. <laughs> so, hi guys. Um, I'm Emma. I'm sure most of you know me. Um, and I'm going to be presenting on the three different Fisher families of Calaveras. Um, everybody that has a blue sticker in this room, if you guys could raise your hands. Perfect. I'm all. Re I'm related to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so really the reason that I wanted to do this presentation was um, once I was starting my um, degree in history, I started an internship at the archives and was surprised that there wasn't very much in their records on our family. And so when I started the Historical Society, I was like, oh, pff, I'll find something. Well, I found something and I found three different Fisher families shoved into one Fisher folder. <laughs> Um, so I took the time and separated that, and with that, I was able to find out a lot more information and like the sheer scale of how big our family was. Like, I've always known it's really big, but all of the um, poster boards that were up here, there's 13 of them, and that's just the Moak Hill Fishers. <laughs> so the sheer size of it was really, really interesting to see, like all put out. Um, so with that. About me, Christopher pretty much mentioned it. Um, one thing he did miss, though, is that I currently work at Gold Country Roasters in Murphy's, and I'm a coffee roaster, and I've been there now for, ooh, going on like six years. <laughs> um, and that's just something that coffee is really near and dear to my heart. Um, I do also do shows at the Met, like Christopher said, um, and I'm currently working on my master's in history through Arizona State Online, and I'm hoping to be done by 2026. <laughs> 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 okay, so I'm going to do um, a little bit of a preview into what led a lot of these um, fishers to the United States. So we're going to start with the events in the German states in 1830 through 1860. Um, so in the 1830s, there was a bourgeoisie revolution, and this was kind of taking a stronghold into Europe. Um, basically, it was just the um, civil unrest between the working class and the upper class. Um, Germany at the time was not a unified nation. It was just separate states. Um, so in the 1830s, there was discrepancy between like the ruling entity and then all of the workers. This carried on into the 1840s, um, tacking on poor harvests, land ownership issues, super rapid industrialization, um, which led to economic instability and a lack of civil rights and working conditions. Um, and this actually all came ahead to a head in 1848 with the German revolutions. Um, the demands are the liberal reform, civil rights, representative government, and elected govern uh, German parliament. Um, so they ended up using barricade tactics similar to what happened in the French Revolution. Um, and this one was somewhat successful. They were able to um, work with King Frederick Wilhelm IV of Prussia to create a national assembly of the German Confederation though this only applied to northern Germany, which we'll see on the next slide. Um, <clears throat> they held their first meeting on May 18th of 1849, and then only a few months later, they dissolved. <laughs> so it was a very short-lived, brief little moment. <laughs> um, and then carrying on into the 1850s and 1860s, there was more unrest. Um, it was getting really not a great place to be in Germany at the time. Um, and this is when a lot of German immigrants left Germany and came to the United States. Um, and then this went into the Franco-Prussian War. I'm going to be real, I had heard this war about one time in my entire like schooling career. Um, and so I decided to do like a little bit of a deep dive. And it, ba it boils down to um, <clears throat> basically the king of, or the Spanish government, or hierarchy, I guess, um, was lacking a king and they had nobody to fill it. So um, they applied to um, King Wilhelm I of Prussia to bring up you know, somebody, a candidate for it. And um, let me actually just, so Wilhelm I, the King of Prussia um, with his chancellor Otto von Bismarck, and then the King of France, Napoleon III. Now the red one, um, for you guys that can't read the teeny tiny little writing, um, is Northern Germany Confederation. The yellow is the Southern German states. And then there's a little beige bit that is Alsace-Lorraine, and that was French territory at the time. Um, 
so basically, King Wilhelm left, um, brought up Prince Leopold, I'm gonna butcher this name, um, <laughs> Prince Leopold Holsenhaller and Sig Sigmargen, if you can say that, <laughs> um, of Prussia. France was not pleased to have a Prussian king ruling over Spain. And so they decided to send a letter to King Wilhelm basically saying, please resend it. Like, we're gonna be surrounded, it's not gonna be great. So um, King Wilhelm uh, agreed. Um, however, their letters in between were kind of insulting each other back and forth, and it was intercepted by Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. And he took that letter and he changed it. And he really only changed one word, which was adjutant, which in German means a military staff officer. So he would rather speak to a military staff officer than you know, the chancellor or the king anymore. Well, in France, or in French, it means someone of no rank. So it was a major insult to France, um, and Otto von Bismarck knew that eventually Germany, or um, Prussia and France would go to war. And six days later, France declared war. And because Bismarck decided to publish that letter, all of southern, um, the southern German states sided with Prussia, which completely screwed up France. <laughs> Um, as France was going into the war very confident that they had a lot more men, they had a different, you know, brand new technology and everything, and they got absolutely destroyed. <laughs> um, and so the Treaty of Frankfurt actually required um, France to give up Auslis Lorraine to Prussia, along with five billion francs. This was in 1871. Um, so five billion francs back then adjusting for today is about 342 billion dollars in francs. So like that amount of money at the time is astronomical even today. <laughs> um, yeah, so with all of that, um, Prussia was able to unify Germany. Germany became one nation, hooray. Um, but so during this time um, between 1830 and 1870, there are about five million immigrants that came from Europe to the United States. Out of those five million, 1.5 were from Germany. And they mostly, I mean, they settled everywhere, but they mostly settled in St. Louis and Cincinnati. Which brings me to Martin and Katharina Schneider turned into Fisher. Um, and they settled in St. Louis. So um, Martin Daniel was from Hessen Castle, Germany. Um, so it's like the state of Hessen he was from Kessel, which is on the northern side. Um, and then there's Frankfurt there to give some sort of idea of where he was at. Um, and he left for America in 1846 with his father and brother, though I believe it was mostly just his brother. Um, it was a bunch of different information. <laughs> um, <clears throat> he was a butcher. Um, he had learned that trade from his father. And um, so he left in about the 1840s, so during that time, a tumultuous time right um, after, well, right before the um, German revolutions. Um, and he came through on the, the George Washington ship um, from Nuremberg, Germany, and he landed in Baltimore and eventually made his way to St. Louis. And he, we're assuming um, he settled in Deutschtown, which is Germantown, which was the like, neighborhood allotted for Germans. Um, and while he was here, he joined the U.S. Army, or the U.S., yeah, the U.S. Army and served in the Mexican-American War for about four months. Um, while he was there, he got a saber. And um, after the war ended and he got out, he applied for a pension and he got that for the rest of his life. What's really interesting with that saber is actually a pretty funny story. So, um, <coughs> So it was either in, I read it as a drunken state or an angry state. Anyway, in whatever state he was in, he decided it would be a great idea to take the saber to the dining room table legs. And <laughs> so in that, he took off a couple inches of one of the table legs. And back in that time, you just don't go out and buy a new one. So they decided that they were just going to match however many inches he took off 
on all of the other legs. And um, that became Uncle Jack McQuaid's table. Um, and that went up to the cabin that we have all the way up past West Point. <laughs> um, and then Katharina, she was born in Wunderhausen, Germany, which is Winterberg. Um, and she came actually earlier than Martin um, and settled with her family. And they got married, um, I believe, in St. Louis. Um, and then during this time, the call of the gold rush was happening. It finally reached the East Coast. Um, and so Martin and Katharina saw a business opportunity and um, they decided to join a German merchant wagon train to go west. So they took the um, California Trail, which is, I kind of marked it out in blue. Um, and so they would have left a little bit northern of St. Louis and come all the way across. That year they left in May, which is really late to try and get to California. Um, and it was a very particularly wet year. So it was already really challenging by the time they got into Nevada. Um, and in Nevada, they were met um, with a group of business and biz businessmen from Stockton um, who promised them businesses and homes in Stockton um, if they promised not to go to the gold country and set up shop. Um, so given that they were running late and they were cutting it close to winter, they agreed. And so they went over the Walker River Trail over um, Sonora Pass. Now this trail was only open for a year because the person who founded it said it was too dangerous for immigrants to pass, which he was not wrong. <laughs> um, so the other map that I have, I outlined kind of where they were at um, or at least something close to it. And if any of you guys have been over Sonora Pass, it's already really rough terrain and I can't imagine doing it in a wagon. And um, one other thing is um, Katharina and Martin already had their two first two children and Katharina was pregnant on this, this journey. Um, and that came to a head actually at Burst Rock. There's a photo and then a bigger version of it. Um, and it was such a big deal that they, the Stanislaus National Forest actually made a monument for it. Um, so they had just crested the Sierras and were getting, I think they crossed the Tuolumne or they were getting ready to cross the Tuolumne River and they got hit with a storm. And um, so Martin had also been acting as a teamster and helping the wagon train because as you can see, um, in order to get up and down the cliffs, they would have to attach the wagons with ropes and haul them up or lower them down. So it was already really hard. <laughs> um, so during this storm, he had built a wooden structure for Katharina and the kids and then went off to help the rest of his wagon train. Well, in the middle of this, Katharina goes into labor with their third child. Um, and so she sends out little four-year-old Martin George to go find help. And he finds a um, native woman, brings her back, and Marika, or Mary Fisher, was born on Sonora Pass. <laughs> And um, they still, that, that wasn't it. Like they still had to come all the way down and they eventually got into um, Stockton where they settled. Um, Martin ended up um, co-owning a um, butcher shop down in Stockton. Um, and while he was there, he couldn't let go of the, the gold rush. And so he ended up moving to Jesus Maria, moved his whole family there. Um, and, uh, set up a butcher shop. And um, from there, they had their five children. Um, <clears throat> let me find my page. Um, so based off of like all of the poster boards that were up here, I did not have enough space on one tiny little slide to fit all of us. Um, so I really only did Martin and Katharina's kids and then their grandkids. Um, so just a couple of um, interesting little things. The um, Elizabeth married into the Ryan King family. Um, and then Mary ended up marrying into the Meyer family. And the Meyer family, I was told, owned most of Double Springs and all the way to Rancho. Um, don't know how long he had that, but I'm assuming <laughs> quite a while. Um, and then the Rab family that um, Catherine would marry into owned a inn in Stockton. 
down on the Stockton River, and they, offer, they operated a cable ferry to take people and goods across the river. And then Martin Daniel Jr., um, he was a teamster and a cattle rancher. And um, he married Roseanne McQuaid McSorley, or McSorley McQuaid, I've seen it both ways, <laughs> in 1888, and they lived in McCallamy Hill. Um, they would have seven children, and then this is the scale of their grand, of Martin and Katharina's grandkids. Um, so just a couple of note, um, there is, George and Amelia had Hazel Fisher, um, which Hazel Fisher Elementary School up in White Pines is named after, and that was because of her dedication and her long teaching career. Um, there's also Norman Rabb, who designed the cable for the original Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, Louise Ryan King married Morton Avery, whose family were the owners and operators of the Avery Hotel. Um, and then Frank Meyer, who was a longtime bank banker and Calaveras School Board member, um, is who the Calaveras High School football field is named after. Um, and then all of uh, Martin Daniels' boys continued with the cattle ranching, um, and Fred would end up working for PG&E for a number of years. <laughs> um, and that's just kind of all the time I had for this particular family. Um, and then these are just some of the photos that I was able to find. Um, Ancestry really helped me out with this one. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is really, this part was really, really fun because I haven't seen a lot of these photos. And then this is just a big block of text of all the family names that the Moak Hill Fishers are related to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to move on now to the um, Sheep Ranch children. Um, where did it go? Okay. So the um, Fishers that settled in Sheep Ranch. Um, were started with George A. and Eva Fisher. Um, George came from Uttenberg, which is the blue one. And then Eva came from Bavaria, which is the red one. Um, and George came to the U.S. in about 1840, so during that time of unrest. Um, and Eva came also during that time, though I wasn't able to nail down an exact date. Um, they had six children. They did um, settle in Jamestown, where they would live the rest of their life in Tuolumne County. Um, three of their children came to Calaveras and settled, um, and that would have been Billy, John James, and Louisa. Um, so their son, Richard, um, I couldn't find very much on. There was one story that said he had died in Tombstone, and I couldn't corroborate whether it was the right one or not, um, but he is on the title page. <laughs> um, and then the one that I have followed and have been in contact with a relative was that of John James. Um, he married Leota McNair, and um, Leota came from the McNair family, um, from Clement McNair, who was a prominent Cherokee Nation member, um, and he also had a key role in establishing Sheep Ranch. Um, so when they got married, they moved up to Sheep Ranch. Um, per, oh gosh, I believe her great-grandmother, so Elizabeth Fisher is the relative that's about, mm, I believe, two generations below these Fishers. Um, and she had talked with her mother um, and asked her about John James. And she said that John James was a uh, humorist with a twinkle in his eye, and Leota was described as eccentric and would often, quote, shoot at those who ignored her no trespassing sign. <laughs> she would inform her lawyer, who was also the district attorney, that she was a good shot and always aimed at their feet. <laughs> Excuse me. They, um, they did have a cattle ranch, um, and they, after Clement um, passed away, they got his ranch up in Sheep Ranch, um, and that's on the, their property is on Armstrong Road up in Sheep Ranch. I'm not too familiar with up there, but for those of you that you know, you probably know. <laughs> um, and then these are their grandkids. And um, so George Grover, um, mostly because I have the most information from his daughter, um, that um, George loved to play music. He loved to host parties. Um, he and his wife, Elsie, 
enjoyed the exact same things. He worked at the Raggio Sawmill and did other side jobs. Um, however, the year 1918 took a toll on this family. Um, and for those who have been up to Sheep Ranch and the Sheep Ranch Cemetery, you'll see there's a Dewey Fisher. It's not related to the Mokill Fishers, like it gets confused with. Um, this Dewey Fisher, who was barely 20, passed away in 1918 of a heart ailment. Um, that same year, they also lost George Grover at the age of 27, who passed away from influenza. Um, and the larger photo on this page was described as the last photo that the family has of everybody all together. Um, later, um, Elsie would remarry, and since she had two small kids, she really didn't have another option. Um, four years later, however, she would pass of cancer at the age of 31, and um, Grover Jr. and Elsie Jr. would go and live with John and Leota. Um, and from what I've gathered, it was a really great time for them when they were little growing up with their grandparents. Um, however, in 1927, John would collapse on the ranch and pass from an internal hemorrhage. Um, so they ended up staying with their grandmother, um, Elsie, went to go live with her aunt down, I believe, in Stockton. Um, and then in 1922, their son, Robert, who was um, fighting overseas in World War I, they hadn't heard anything from him. They had assumed he had been killed or, you know, captured. Um, they did get word that he was alive and he was coming home. However, um, he was killed on, in an accident on the ship on his way home. Yeah, this was, this part of the, the research was not fun. <laughs> um, what was really interesting was, um, so at the museum in the jail, we know about two people that escaped. And one of them, we didn't really know the name, but now we do. And it was 16-year-old Grover Fisher, who was arrested by Sheriff's Wing and was being held in jail to await trial. He didn't want to stay in jail, and he decided to escape. So he used his mattress and he put it up against the wall. He pried the bars loose, which I'm still not sure how he would have done that. Um, <laughs> and he scaled the jail yard wall to freedom. Um, and he did leave a poem behind to tell Zwing why he needed to leave and thanked him for being so kind about the whole, the whole ordeal. Um, I tried to get the poem, but it just wouldn't work for me. So. <laughs> Um, we'll have that available at the Historical Society if you guys want to read it. Um, he was also described by his daughter in his early years during the Depression as being, quote, on the bum. Um, and he worked different jobs and, you know, traveled all across the, the, the country, um, just, just trying to make his way in the Depression. He eventually settled down and um, had a family. Um, Elizabeth is in this far right one with the black and white. She is the first one in the back row. She is still living. She actually lives up in Washington. Um, and she was so amazing to talk to, to get all this information on her family. Um, and she also donated and made the book that's on the back there by her family tree. So take a look on it, because it was really cool. Okay. And then an overall of their family tree. And then the last Fishers um, that I decided to look at today. Um, were Conrad and Lena Fisher, or Fisher without the C. I saw it spelled both ways, so I kind of had to throw them both in there. Um, so Conrad was born in 1843 in Germany, though it's not known when he came to California, or to the U.S. anyways. Um, he married Lena Grun and had three kids. He was working in the mines. He was also a proprietor of the Miners Hotel and Saloon in Angels Camp. Um, and the reason I have the Leitner Mine photo on here is talking with Maureen Elliott that works at the archives and who's written books on Angel's Camp. She had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> um, and we've narrowed it down to um, the new part of Utica Park that they're trying to redo and all this stuff. Um, that was the old side of the Leitner Mine. And so we're assuming that this building was like on the highway bit right in front of it, um, and he didn't own the building, somebody else did, so he just rented it and ran his business out of it. Um, he would 
unfortunately pass on one of the bar stools in his saloon um, <laughs> from heart from a heart ailment, whatever that means. <laughs> um, his wife, Lena, would keep the hotel for about a year after he passed, and then she would move over to Sutter Creek. Um, and uh, even though she had passed in Sutter Creek, she was buried in Altaville. One interesting thing from just about Lena was that she was born in Alsace Lorraine in France. By the time her family had left, it was Germany, which was really cool. <laughs> and then these are their children and grandkids. Um, okay, um, Agnes, um, I believe is on here. Yes, Agnes, um, one of their grandchildren is one of the only ones that decided to stay in Angel's camp. The rest of them all moved after um, Conrad had passed away. Um, <clears throat> and then I don't have any photos of these guys, but I found newspaper articles. Um, unfortunately, two of them are obituaries. <laughs> um, but it was basically, they were both really great people. From what I gathered, they contributed a lot to the community. Um, and then their family tree. And then, since I couldn't fit all the Fisher families in the county on, you know, one big whole thing, um, I kind of had to, you know, throw the rest of them in somewhere. Um, so, um, we have Eugenia or Jeannie and Eli Fisher um, that came from Colorado and settled here. They had Harriet, which we have a few photos of, um, and they she opened up an ice cream parlor in Jackson. Um, Frederick and Bernice Fisher, um, I really couldn't find very much information on him. Um, I had found one source that said he drowned himself in Seibel's Reservoir and Penn Gulch and Murphy's. Um, that was all I could really find on the man, which is really sad. Um, and then <coughs> talking with, um, I believe, Kirk Smith today, I learned something new. Um, so I had been trying and trying and trying to figure out who Dr. Fisher was. Um, and it turns out that he married into the Miwoks in West Point, correct? No? Oh, okay. He had kids. Okay. He had kids <laughs> with um, a member of the Miwok tribe in West Point. And then there was another Martin J. Fisher who came from Portugal and he is buried in the old hospital cemetery or the pauper cemetery. Couldn't find anything else on him. <laughs> um, and so that's pretty much my whole presentation. I did want to open it up to you guys to like, you know, talk about any fun Fisher stories or any fun Fisher memories that you have with any of these families. Um, and I believe I have time for that. Yeah, I've got like, Five or, five or ten minutes. Mm. So I'm going to go ahead and get you guys the roaming mic. Um, so if anybody wants to share, just raise your hand. No? Great. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, guys. <laughs>